I'd like to call to order the Clarkston Independent District Library Board of Trustees meeting for January 13, 2020. The meeting will be called to order at 6.30 p.m. Let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call, please. Dan Gaffney? Here. Dan Green? Here. Allison McDadden Keeson? Here. Nancy Moon? Here. Marilyn Pomeroy? Here. Ann Rose Absent? Chris Schultz? Here. Julie Here. Okay. Alexander <coughs> Molson? So to approve the agenda. I agenda. <laughs> 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 And we have a second? Yeah. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the agenda as presented. Are there any comments or questions? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Call to the public. We have a new liaison tonight. You can do it from right there if you like. Okay, I'm Laura Perkins, and I'm the new liaison from the Friends of the Library Board. Um, and I was told that I have to report on what we did last week, or this week, I guess. Okay, for one thing, we are implementing logistics, which is a computer database to manage our employees, I mean, our volunteers. Um, we also voted to buy a second bookcase to match the one in the hallway, so that we'll have a more attractive display. And we received a $5,000 check from Bowman Chevrolet to um, help with our summer reading program. Hey, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that tonight will end our call to the public <coughs> at 635. I'll accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. The moved and seconded to Accept the consent agenda, which contains six items tonight. Any comments or questions? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Next, Julie will present library statistics. Okay. So that would be a um, little pile of papers in front of you. They would be the two pages that are on the top. They are the brightly colored, brightly colored ones. Um, one of the things that you'll need to notice, these would be the statistics for the month of December. Um, on that first paper, it says totals of visitors. There's a big zero. <laughs> our, our people counter died. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, so we um, have nothing tracking for the month of December. So it's not that we did not have plenty of people well, here. I can say that I came here. So. <laughs> <laughs> As did I. So. Yes. That too. Yes. So we are in the process of buying a new people counter and getting a new one installed. So unfortunately, um, we were hoping it was a battery issue. It is not. Mm. So. Well, it's been in duty for quite some time. It has been. We've had it for a number of years. Um, in addition, you also have um, some statistics um, that are listed volunteer hours. Um, these come from, um, from uh, Adrienne Palumbo, who is our Community Relations Volunteer Coordinator. Um, she started with us in April um, and started tracking our uh, volunteers in June. So this report goes from um, June until the end of the year. Now this does not include all of the Friends of the Library book sale and all of that. She's doing the volunteers that are specifically working on library type um, things. And there were a total of 318 and a half hours. Um, she's got a nice little breakdown here of what all they do while they're here. Um, so we've got an adult services programming assistant. Um, we have, a, have ones that help cleaning crew. Those are people that are cleaning books. Um, we have summer reading program registration assistant, youth services program assistant, and youth services program prep. So those are the people that you know cut out little things for summer reading or for um, story time and things like that. Um, so those are all um, lovely um, to have that kind of help. Um, in terms of valuation, she's using what is considered a, a volunteer standardized valuation, um, which would be a value of eight thousand ninety-nine dollars and forty-six cents. Wow. All right. 
really nice. Yes. So, yes. so thank you, Adrian, for working on that. Is that based on IRS numbers? Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I think she's using um, something that is considered standard for volunteer nonprofit work. She used to work for the okay. Detroit Zoo, okay. um, and yeah. that was the way that they were they were tracking it. So she's using whatever that is. I can double check and. and I'm just was curious. <coughs> I'm sure that the IRS, I think IRS has IRS some. Thing. Yeah. I think it's a nonprofit thing. Just curious. Yeah. Not having to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> um, also, um, this isn't really part of the director's report. It's a little, a little bit more statistics. But there is a, an annual rep report from the, um, from the marketing team, which would be um, Adrian and Trevor, our business and marketing librarian. Um, so they wanted to point out that in terms of building improvements, um, we unveiled the business center this year. Um, the computer room, which would be this room, transitioned into the conference room. Mm -hmm. um, they've done um, a, a boatload of improved signage, wayfinding, both indoors and outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of events and community connections, they've been working on the Ask Your Representative um, collaboration with ITV. Um, of course, we were in the 4th of July parade, which is something we do every year. We at attended over 100 external events and meetings representing the library, um, the Clarkson Area Chamber of Commerce events are now hosted regularly here at CIDL, the Young Professionals Network, and the new member orientation. So monthly and bi-monthly meetings that are part of the chamber are coming here, which is really nice. Um, Community Impact Weekend, um, Adrian is on the planning committee, and we are part of the event participation. So in the spring, um, our project is the um, book sale, and in the fall, we do letter writing. So last year, we did um, letter writing to our um, first responders, our police and fire, and this year we did letter writing to Homebound. So they did something to send Home on the Meals on Meals program. Um, in terms of reaching new audiences, we did um, a new library card sign-up promotion in September. Um, we've been doing new home homeowner outreach letters um, each month. Um, we've updated the CIDL flyer included in Township Welcome Packet. Um, Record-breaking summer reading registrations with over a thousand individuals. Increasing visibility, um, we had the vote for the best, the number one library campaign and celebration. Um, increased social media presence, including Facebook Live videos, and improved constant contact usage with regular open rates of 30 to 50%. So these are all things from Adrian. That's nice. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, from yeah. the marketing department, they did their own little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because it's, I mean, I'll start a notebook. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's, 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 very, very it's good nice. to know what they're yeah. accomplishing. Yeah, it's, so that's it's very nice. It is. They've, they've done a lot this year working together to make a good team. So. Excellent. Yeah. Now for our library director's report. Okay. Um, so in terms of general information, on Sunday, January 12, 2020, so that would be yesterday, um, the two morning full-time employees um, came in at 11 instead of 10 to assure that there was time for the snow plowing contractor to fully treat ice in the parking lot. We don't open until 1, so it didn't really affect public service or anything like that, but I just thought I'd let you know that we did do that. Um, Saturday ended up not being as icy as we anticipated, but we were on the lookout for that all day, and, and we fared pretty well, actually. Um, for project updates, at their meeting on December 17th, the Township Board appointed, as you all know, Janice Gaffney, Daniel Green, Allison McFadden, Kiesling, Marilyn Pomeroy, and Christy Schell to the library board to fill their five positions for the term beginning on January 1st, 2020. Um, I wanted to make sure that ended up in the notes because last month we didn't really know for sure what the township was going to do because your meeting was before their meeting. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, next item, the library's attorney sent me the draft of the fund balance policy and fund balance resolution, which is something that I've been working with her on for the last few months. Um, the drafts have been reviewed by the library board treasurer and president, <coughs> so we anticipate these going um, on to the February meeting agenda for library board review. Um, next item, the question came up regarding whether it is possible to participate in library board meetings remotely. We do not currently have a policy regarding this possibility, so I contacted our attorney. Recently the law changed and there is now a requirement to provide remote participation for anyone serving in the military and other reasons can be included in that policy. Um, so I'm currently working with our attorney to draft a policy that the board can review. We anticipate this policy being on the agenda in the February meeting as well. Um, next item, the library's 2020 budget includes the creation and implementation of a new strategic plan. We would like the library board to have representation on the strategic planning committee. So we hope that this project will be of interest to someone on the board. So I'll leave you to decide who you might want to have do that at some point. 
Um, next item, in the creation of the library's budget. Each year, the library board's staffing subcommittee works with me on organizational structure, wages, benefits, etc. During last year's budget workshop, um, it was suggested it might also be helpful to have a capital improvement plan subcommittee to work with me on prioritizing building projects. Budget subcommittees usually meet uh, once or twice in the spring to review where we are now, what ideas are out there in terms of um, necessary and discretionary costs, and assist in the discussion that leads to the budget draft that is reviewed at the budget workshop in July or August. If the board would like to initiate um, a CAP subcommittee, it would be something that could be decided in the next few months. Okay. Um, next, we have been working on updating and adding some signage throughout the building, as was in the lovely marketing report. <laughs> um, new signs that have recently been added include labels for the information desk and the new conference room, which hopefully help people find this room tonight. Um, we also discovered that our sign in the library's driveway has developed cracks. This sign is shared with the Clarkson Community Historical Society, so we talked to them about it, and they would like to do some sort of update. This sign was installed in 2005 with an update of the plastic inserts in 2013. Unfortunately, we did not notice um, the wear on this um, until after the budget was approved. So this is not a budgeted item in 2020. Um, in order to proceed with this item, we will need to bring a proposal to the board for consideration in the coming months. But we'll work that out with the Historical Society first and put all costs hands up. It's fun to let you know that's on the horizon. <laughs> um, and last but not least, um, the library houses the Community Information Network, known as the CIN website, a grant project from the early 1990s in which Susan and Bill Basinger created an online resource of information about the historic homes in Clarkson's historic district. Over the past two years, the library has been working with the local web company IGD Solutions to turn the site into a database and update the platform for new technologies. The Clarkson Historic District Commission is beginning to work on a project to review and update guidelines and information on the homes in the historic district. Um, I was asked if the library could assist on, in this project. Our, our uh, participation would be twofold. We will continue our work updating the CIN website, and we will have um, assigned a librarian to help the commission's study group with their research to assure that all of the new information that is gathered is included in the database that we've been working on. So that's you know, something that we have done. Um, putting together um, and working on in terms of supporting that archiving of that information. Is there anything on that? <coughs> nope, that's good. <coughs> okay. Right. We will, remove, we will now move to our regular business, and the first item of regular business is to elect the board president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer for this working year. So at the moment, we have two people who have stepped down, so we are going to ask for nominations for each of the positions at this time. So I will accept a motion for appointment as president. I nominate Marilyn Conroy as Second. president. <laughs> Are there any other nominations for this position? If not, I'll accept a nomination for appointment as vice president. I nominate Dan okay. Green. I second. <laughs> Any other nominations for this position? If not, we'll accept a nomination for appointment as treasurer. I nominate Jan Gaffney. Second. Any other nominations for that position? And finally, nomination for secretary. I nominate Allison McFadden Kiesling. I second. Any other position, any other nominations for that position? All right, so we now have a slate that includes Marilyn Pomeroy, Dan Green, Jan Gaffney, and Allison McFadden Kiesling as our board. I'll accept a motion for approval. Can I make a motion? Yes. Okay. And is there a second? I second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we elect this slate of officers. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed, nay. The board is selected for the year. Thank you, everybody. Second, it's the first of the year, so it's time for us to review um, board duties and responsibilities, things that we should know as a board. 
And actually the board likes to do this at the beginning of each year to just refresh for those of us who've been on and as a informational item for those who are joining us. <coughs> So, Julie, have okay. you got materials you would like to? Yeah, I have. <laughs> While she's getting them out, let me, make, let me refer back to our, the library director's report. It's been the policy of the board since we were first inaugurated that board members serve in various capacities in the library so that someone on the board is generally knowledgeable about things that are going on. So someone sits on staffing, someone sits in on interviews, someone works on um, budgeting. So we have various ones. So you notice we have three possible new ones that are underlined here in the director's report. So what we like to do is have people work in capacities in which they are comfortable and interested. So as you underline the Strategic Planning Committee, the Staffing Subcommittee, the Capital Improvement Plan Committee, think of these areas and if there's anything that sounds interesting, we like to have a, a board member on each of the committees. And that way someone on the board is knowledgeable about what's going on. We have additional information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are we doing that now? No, not necessarily. Okay. I'm just you think you got something in mind? No, I just I just want to continue on the staffing subcommittee. I would too. Okay, so yes. you notice that these two tend to be on the staffing subcommittee. We've been doing it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I enjoy being on the hiring yeah. end of things, so that's fine. Well, so, I've been on the staffing subcommittee also, and I would be happy to continue yeah. with that. Yeah. Also, we have evaluation subcommittees, too, and I don't know if people want, so we will, I think when we get to the time when we're going to discuss, we usually do evaluations later in the year, and at that time, the board works on a self-evaluation, and we also evaluate the library director. So keep that in mind. I do have a question about the strategic planning. How, what, what's the time commitment? on that because I would love to do that but I need to I, yeah, it's, it's gonna be really hard for me to say this early in the game <laughs> <laughs> we're not ready for that yet no uh, no it's gonna depend a lot on how the committee wants to go forth and, okay. and what we decide to do okay. so. Just, I'll I, keep, I, I would be interested okay there. I'll try to have that set up so that we've got a better um, I can give you a better idea of uh, what that time commitment would look like I'll make a note to do that does, does that include ideas and building or would be anything yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just the the staff in the library is very active on Julie's very much of a consensus builder and collaborative. If it's going to affect you, you should have a say <laughs> in yeah. in some of the decision making. And so she's very inclusive. And so and we like the staff to know that we're interested also. Yeah. <laughs> We're not, we're not just sitting here once a month rubber stamping. Would you like to be involved and know what's going on? I'd be interested in capital improvement and strategic planning if you need two people. Okay. You just can't have four. Right. <laughs> if you have four, it qualifies as an open meeting. Right. <laughs> I can't have two meetings. Talk a little bit more about that. Okay. I'm ready when you are. You ready for me to go ahead? Hey. Okay. All right. So first and foremost, I've got a little PowerPoint up here, and I've got a whole pile of paper, and I'll kind of in include these pieces as we go. Can everybody see okay? Mm -hmm. First of all, welcome um, to the library board. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about how things work behind the scenes. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we share information with the public. Um, we have The main way that we do that um, is on our website. So we do have a library board website. If you go on to um, show you, this. if you go on to our new website, that's very up to date. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that one's not us. Sorry. There we go. Okay, so if you go to our main website, 
um, and you go under um, the About tab, you can see that we do have the library board um, under the About tab. And when you click on that, um, we do have pictures of our board members. So I have two new board members who currently don't have little photos on there that we will we will get photos of you and add you in, and we will um, make changes to um, the officers now that we've got voted on officers. And then we have our library board meetings. And then the other important piece that we have down here at the bottom, um, we have direct links to the library's bylaws. Um, there is a PDF of the board meetings. And most importantly is this little link right here that says agendas, minutes, packets, and archived meetings. And if you click on that, we actually have something that's called documents on demand. This is something that the township uses um, as well as the library. Um, and you can see off to the side here, we have um, agendas, minutes, agenda packets, audits, videos, budgets, um, and all of the history of the district library establishment and how we did that in the library, um, district library agreement. So for example, um, if a patron were interested in, in what was going on, there's our agendas, all of our agendas from 2012 to 2020, we established in 2012. Um, you can go in and you can see all the minutes. You can go in and see the agenda packets, um, including the one for tonight. Um, and we post those on the um, Friday before the meeting. So, um, so all of that information is on there. We do post all of our audits. We are videotaping this evening's meetings and we have all of the videos, recording, um, recordings of the meetings. And then budgets. The interesting thing about the budgets is that we archive back. So um, the board approves a budget in September of the year preceding that year. So. The budget for 2019 was approved in September of 2018. And these are all of the times that the library board amended the budget throughout the year. Any small amendments that we make, you move a little bit of money from one account to another, that sort of thing, that's all um, archived. So that people can see from, from one month to the next when those changes occurred. Any questions about any of that? No. We're very in favor of transparency. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So the nice thing about that is that um, that it does allow us, oops, don't do that. Um, the nice thing about having everything so clearly on the website is that um, when people ask um, if there's a FOIA request, for example, most of the information is already out there. It makes it very quick for them. Um, so we don't get a lot of freedom of information at FOIA requests. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Okay. So getting to know more about the board meetings themselves, um, <coughs> library board meetings are once a month on a Monday at 6.30 p.m. They used to be at 6, now they're at 6.30. Meetings are televised and archived on the website, as we just discussed. Um, meeting packets are emailed to board members, printed and placed in board member mailboxes, and posted to the website the Friday before the meeting. Um, within the packet, each agenda item starts with a meeting agenda item form, which we in the building call a MAFE that summarizes history, context, and recommendations about that item. So whenever myself or somebody on staff does an agenda item, they have to fill out that MAFE to put with everything else that goes in the board packet. So you'll be able to see that um, in your packet and it helps you as you're going through the packet. The MAFE is then followed by any important supporting documentation. Yes, I those. Board members also receive a working agenda with their packet that indicates which items need a vote, details that should be included in the motion, um, and the type of vote needed, standard or roll call. Um, so, with, so what happens with the uh, working agenda is that I am the library board's employee. Um, if there's something in the board packet that I'm not sure whether it means a standard or a roll call vote, I call the attorney on your behalf, find out, put it in the working agenda, it keeps your meeting running smoothly. That way you know whether or not you need a roll call or whether or not you need um, a standard vote, whatever is needed. I can do all of that in advance and helps the meeting run nice and smooth for you. Um, whenever possible, meeting handouts are included in the minutes, unless they are documents that cannot be publicly posted, such as materials subject to copyright laws or privi privileged legal communications from the library's attorney. Now tonight, I have an example of um, something that would not be put in because of copyright um, in your little pile of handouts in front of you. There's quite a lot of handouts, so I love that. Um, there is an article called 10 Ways to Avoid Violating the Open Meetings Act. This was written by our attorney. Um, she gave me permission to give each of you a reader's copy, but she did not give me permission to publicly post this anywhere. So the library board will be getting a copy of this, but it will not go into the minutes because that, by putting it on our website, would be publishing it 
outside of, it would be a violation of copyright. So, um, so you've got this article that you can read, but the public can actually get to see that article. It's always good to have an example. It is, it is. <laughs> but I, I have a feeling people might be, be wondering what would what would be constituted by a copyright violation. And is if, if I've gotten permission to give each of you something, but I don't have permission to give 35,000 residents or the World Wide Web that information. Okay, so the next thing um, is our attorney did give you um, a nice little packet of orientation material. Um, and I'm gonna do the sort of brief highlighted version of that packet of material. That was also in your packet. The, um, the full version is not in the packet, but the, um, the abridged version I about to talk about. In terms, of library, in terms of responsibilities, the library board is the governing body of the library. You are the policy makers. The library board's official spokesperson is the president. Um, the library board is subject to the Open Meetings Act. Any gathering of four or more board members is a quorum and should be posted in advance and open to the public. Committees and subcommittees with fewer than four board members in attendance and have no decision-making authority are not subject to the Open Meetings Act. That's your subcommittees that we were just talking about. So that includes the staffing subcommittee, that includes the CIP subcommittee, um, the evaluation subcommittee. The library board um, should not send emails to the entire group because group discussions via email could be construed as a meeting. Um, if I send an email to the entire board, I will send it blank copy email. So if you reply to that message, um, it will only go to me and that will prevent the danger of impropriety. So for example, if I send out your board packet and I will say, hey, so we have a meeting on Monday night, it's at 6.30, this is your board packet. Um, I always include in there, please let me know if you're going to be unable to attend so I can make the forum. So let's say, in this case, Ann emailed me back and said, am I going to be able to make it to the meeting? I would then, I could then email the whole board and say, hey, just, to, just as an update, Ann's not going to be able to make it to the meeting, so if anybody else can't make it, we're down one person. Um, if she had replied to all, then that would be considered a, a meeting. So um, if there's anything that comes back to me, I will make sure it goes back out to the board in a way that's appropriate. Um, but it makes sure that we don't accidentally get into a conversation that we shouldn't be doing via email, because that would be like a private meeting. <coughs> Um, the administrative assistants and the library director will ensure that meetings um, and minutes are posted according to the guidelines. Um, in terms of the Freedom of Information Act, the library director is the FOIA coordinator. So um, just a few months ago, we approved an updated FOIA policy. Our FOIA policy um, is on our library website. I'm going to tell you right out of the gate, it's huge. So if you want something to um, yes. solve yes. some sort of insomnia problems, <laughs> yeah. I, I suggest you read our FOIA policy. Um, <laughs> but if you go into, um, oh, there it is, library, library policies. And there's the FOIA tab right there. So it's under library policy, about, and then library policies. Um, we have the full FOIA policy and procedure, and then there, it is required by law that there is a summary version um, that's a little bit easier for, for <laughs> reading purposes, and that's how to request a public record and other FOIA information. So all of that is on the website. Um, if there is a FOIA request that identifies me as the person that receives that information, and, um, and I handle that on the library's behalf. Um, and then another thing to be aware of is the Michigan Library Privacy Act. Um, library records, that's to say contact information, lists of materials that are checked out, etc., are considered confidential and require a court order for release. So we are very particular about who handles our database of information. Um, the integrated library system, known as an ILS, is the software that we use in order to manage the comings and goings of materials. And I like to explain it um, as it's two parts. It is a database of absolutely everything the library owns. It's a huge catalog. And then it is also a database of everybody who has a library card. And so when you come into the library with your library card and you check something out, this lovely piece of software says, hey, this person has this material and it is due on this date. All of that is confidential. We do not share that with anybody. And the law states that we do not share that with anybody. If somebody were to want that, they would need a court order in order to get it. Um, so that's just um, the Michigan Library Privacy Act protecting your privacy. And there's no record kept of what anyone has checked out. Once you have returned an item, it is deleted from the system. The only caveat to that is you are able to turn on a reading history. 
the patron has to do that. We cannot do that on their behalf. Um, and it will let them know that if we have the information and there's a court order, we do have to turn it over. So that's one of the ways that we protect your privacy is um, when you return things, as long as there's no fine or fee attached to it, everything disappears off of your record. And so we can't give up information that we don't have. So there's no reason for us to archive that for posterity, so we don't. It would make for a lot of um, space needed on our server to store it all anyway. So, okay. Okay, so in terms of the board project calendar, um, there's some things that are sort of board driven um, projects that do happen. The first thing we do in January, um, we elect officers. We've taken care of that, cross that off the to do list. You feel very accomplished now. Um, in March and April, we do our annual audit. Um, the library pretty much handles the audit, um, but you will get an audit report that usually takes place in June or July, depending on. Um, what works with the library board's agenda. <coughs> um, there, um, during the audit process, um, they do, um, the auditor will contact two library board members to um, ask some additional questions about how things are run and make sure that everything is being done um, appropriately and ethically and that sort of thing. So just so you know, that usually happens in March or April. Um, in March through June, um, the staffing subcommittee and now a capital improvement plan subcommittee will meet. There's usually one or two meetings of those groups. Um, and what they're doing is they're assisting um, with the creation of the draft budget. So um, the staffing subcommittee works on wages and benefits and that sort of thing. The capital improvement plan subcommittee will help prioritize um, things to be done to the building and act. <coughs> the building is um, almost 30 years old. So there's lots, just like a house, there's lots to be done. Um, I have a very, very large spreadsheet of absolutely everything that is tied to this building, all of the heating and the cooling and the tables and the chairs and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> and um, when it was purchased or installed, and it's expected like, life, life, oh, it's life expectancy. expectancy. Yep. Yeah. And then at the, at, the, at the last of it, there's a little um, column of priorities. I give it a one, two, or a three. If it's a three, we're all good. If it's a one, we should be thinking about how we're going to fund the replacement of that. So when um, the capital improvement plan subcommittee meets, we would be looking at that more closely and then prioritizing those things, planning ahead. Yeah. Um, in July or August, the board holds an annual budget workshop. That's when the board gets together in a small room like this. We roll up our sleeves and we go over the entire draft of the budget for the coming year, um, ask all of our questions, clarify all of the answers, um, make any changes, um, and then in August or September, the board holds public hearings on the millage rate and the budget and approves the budget. So we are done planning the budget in September for the following year. Even though our fiscal year is January to December, we get done in September, cross out the to-do list, and finish up the year strong, and then start in January with a brand new fresh budget that has been already put to bed a few months already. So in September to December, we change gears and we do performance reviews. So um, the library's um, department heads do um, performance reviews for all of the library staff. And then the library board does my performance review and then a self-review of the board itself. So from September to December, we're all looking at reviewing. <laughs> <laughs> and then from October to February, um, the library's annual state aid report is filed. And that sounds like a really long window, but really what happens is um, our fiscal year is January to December. The state's fifth fiscal year is October to September. So um, the state runs their, it would make sense if we run the same fiscal year as the state, <laughs> that in October they would be gathering all of the data from the previous year. But since we are on a January to December, in October they say, hey, we want your last year's statistics. So it's January, I'm gathering all of the 2019 statistics and I'm putting them in a folder because the state's not going to ask me for them till October. <laughs> But that's great because it gives me a lot of time to gather all that up, make sure I have all of the, the appropriate details. It's a 12-page report. It's lots and lots of really exciting Tiny information. <laughs> Another opportunity for um, insomnia, cure, <laughs> if so needed. Um, but anyway, uh, we do that, and then um, usually between October and December is when I file that report. And then in January, we start all over again asking the staff to help me gather all of that data. Any questions about any of that? And it all goes really, really smoothly. You see the report for the previous year. So we looked at 2018's data in December of 2019. That's just kind of the way it works. It's <laughs> silly, but that's how it works. Okay, 
So the next thing we're going to talk about um, is the organizational structure. So in terms of organizational structure, um, the library board, um, as I said, are the policy makers and the governing body. Um, the library board is responsible for um, hiring a director. I am, at this point, your director. Um, and then all of the um, library employees report to me. And this is the structure by which they report to me. So we have, um, on, on the first level, you see a number of department heads. Um, you see... Um, you see a number of department heads, then you see the, the, um, the full-time employees that are not department heads, and then we have all of our part-timers underneath that. Any questions about that? Thank you. We just got a new sheet. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll it was a, okay. I know. I'm trying to keep all. There's a lot of paper tonight. That's okay. okay. We got it. You got it? <laughs> it's in there. All right. Um, so when it comes to full-time employees, we do currently have 11 full-time employees, um, as was um, approved in the um, 2020 budget. We are adding a 12th employee, and we will be doing that in the spring. Um, when we hire full-time employees, the library board um, approves, first of all, you approve the posting. I can't post for a full-time employee until the board says yay. Um, and then when we have gone through the selection process and we have a recommendation to make the library board also approves the person that we have selected. Um, Part-time employees, um, I have the ability to um, hire those people um, on my own um, as long as they stay within budget. Uh, but the staffing committee and the board see what that list looks like, and we and we have a certain number of positions. So if I were thinking that I were going to have additional positions, you would know about that during the staffing committee process and during the approval of the budget. But if I have a part timer, I'm not going to come to you every time a shelver quits to go work at another restaurant or some other library or whatever. Thank I will you. go ahead and replace the people <laughs> with low drama um, because they do come and go. Um, Sometimes the part the full timers come and go, but lately we've been doing really good on that back of wood. We have to keep those going smoothly. Any questions about the comings and goings of employees and organizational structure? It will all make more sense as we go through the year, I'm sure. All right. Um, so the next thing is the budget. And theoretically, if you just turn the page, you should be, there we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry for making so much stirring. Okay. So when we're, when we're looking at the budget, I actually sort of divide the budget in my head into um, two parts. The top half is our staffing budget. It is most common for a library's um, staffing costs to be between 50 and 65% of the total operating budget for the year. Uh, we do try to keep it at 60%. Um, that assists us if we ever have a situation where something changes mid-year, um, so that we've got a cushion, um, so that we're not shooting way past um, what we would consider to be an appropriate top-end level. Um, and it also gives me a lot of guide guidance when I'm trying to figure out what I want to do in the coming year in terms of um, wages and benefits and, and that sort of thing. Um, the other half of the budget, which is sort of this middle section right here, uh, that's our operating budget. So that's everything that has to do with collections, that has to do with heating and cooling and, and just the running of the building in general, um, keeping the building up um, in good repair, um, and that sort of thing. And I have a number of people on staff that help me with the various pieces, pieces of this budget. For example, our lead custodian um, is in charge of line 931, which is our buildings and grounds budget. She and I work very closely on it, but she does a lot of the monitoring herself, and, and we work on that together. So, for example, that 931 budget would include lawn mowing and snow plowing, um, repairs. Um, we have rugs that are in front of the circulation desk that are rental that get cleaned every month. That's all included in that 931 budget. Um, does that all make sense? And so she kind of oversees that, and I oversee what she's, she's looking at. Okay. The bottom little piece of the budget down here, uh, that's our revenues section. So that's how we get to the number that we have. So if you look at 2020 um, under the revenue line, you can see that our millage will bring in just over $2 million. 
Um, the next thing that's listed is the CIA capture the corridor on Freedom Authority text capture. That's set at zero because the library board has opted the library out of that. Um, but I leave it on there because we're still, this budget still includes us being able to see 2018 and 2018 now with a text capture. <coughs> so I haven't deleted it completely. We won't see that going forward in the next budget year. Um, state aid, that's we talked to, referred to a little bit ago about that state aid report. That's the information that we send to the state. And in return, we do get some money back from the state that helps support the library. Um, when we do the, um, the estimates for how much that money is, that is actually a very low ball estimate because our state aid money comes in in two pieces. Um, and sometimes if the state gets tied on money, they sometimes threaten not to give us the other half. So I'm very careful about budgeting in, um, conservatively to assure that um, if they were to yank that money, we wouldn't be making cuts mid-year. Um, that if the money does come, great, we can afford to do some additional things that we hadn't um, maybe been, been able to do. Um, that also helps if not all our millage gets collected. Yeah, every once in a while some, some um, taxes don't get collected and that kind of thing. So this keeps us from shooting over our budget at the end of the year if I, if I do it conservatively. Um, penal fines. Penal fines is an interesting thing that most people don't know about. Um, <laughs> penal fines is um, a portion of um, court costs and um, traffic tickets and that sort of thing. It's written into Michigan's Constitution that, the, that libraries do get a little piece of that. Um, and what happens is um, the county keeps track of everything. And there's a very complicated algorithm that figures out who gets what and how much. Um, and we get a piece per resident in our service population. So our total service population is 35,563. And our state aid money is usually about maybe a dollar thirty-nine or something along that times 35,563. We get that as one big check. This is another one that I also um, when I'm estimating it for budgeting purposes, I estimate it a little bit low because we don't know how many people are going to get speeding tickets. We don't know how many police officers are going to issue speeding tickets. Um, we don't know how many people are going to pay their court costs. We just really don't know. So what we do is we look at the trends, historically speaking, um, and kind of very conservatively raise and lower it with the trends. Um, it has been as high as $75,000. It has been as low as $40,000 in my almost 14 years here. So we just don't know. But it has been trending up in the $70,000 range the last few years. So we're in pretty good shape with that. But I always budget it a little bit low because we just don't know. A lot of people are trying to cross Yep. <laughs> fines and fees um, is exactly what it sounds like. It's, um, it is library fines and fees for room rentals and that sort of thing. Um, duplicating and photocopying, that's exactly what that sounds like. Um, people who make photocopies at our copy machine or print out uh, printers. Um, that's the money we collect for that. Interest is the money um, on our investments. We, in, we do our investing very conservatively. We ha do have some interest-bearing accounts, and so that brings in um, about, actually probably I would say brings in closer to twelve to $13,000, but you never know how that's going to go either, so I always estimate that a little bit low. And then the last thing that you see on there is E-rate. E-rate is federal money um, that comes in that helps us pay for our broadband internet. It's like a grant from the federal government. Um, and it is to help us assure that our community um, has uh, good access to internet. So the amount of money that we get is based on the number of children in the school district that are eligible for the free lunch program. Um, and then they, there's a special formula that they multiply it out and we get somewhere between three and five thousand dollars a year. Okay. Um, we have sometimes um, in the past done some transfer from fund balance. We never do that at the beginning of the year, but we have in the past decided to do some additional projects. We have a nice healthy fund balance. Um, as was um, alluded to in my director's report, um, the fund balance should have a policy as to what we keep in check for the purpose of running the library in an emergency. The auditor suggests usually three to five or six months of um, your annual operating costs to keep in fund balance. We have significantly more than that, but the reason that we do is because it is money set aside because our building is 30 years old um, and we would like to do some renovations on the building um, and definitely do some repairs and, um, and things like that. So what um, has been recommended by our auditor is that we set aside um, a percentage of, of fund balance that is the emergency fund 
and then designate the rest of it through board resolution for the purpose of um, those renovations and repairs on the building um, and designate it as having a purpose. Because it does. It's not a big chunk of money sitting there with no purpose. Um, we could potentially um, decide to expand the building or want something along those lines. So if we wanted to do those kinds of things, that's what that money would be for and the board um, should vote and officially designate it as such. So that's what the attorney is helping us do is write, write out that information. Write out those policies mm -hmm. and that for the next month. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you don't, and you don't want to just put it there without a designation, but it's also nice to, if you have a healthy fund balance, that's a good time to plan for those kinds of things Absolutely. so you don't have to do a bond issue oh, yeah. and borrow money to be paid back by the taxpayers. If we've got the money, then that's... Okay. That's what it would be for. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why you're treasurer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then the last thing that you have, um, there's resources, and these are part of the handouts that were um, in front of you when you sat down. So the first resource um, that I would have you consider is the Library of Michigan, which is www.michigan.gov slash library trustee. Library of Michigan does great resources on their website. Um, there are two things that they do that are most helpful. The first one is the Michigan Public Library Trustee Manual. Um, that is something that is um, available online. We also have um, trustee manuals in the building. The American Library Association also has ones that have been published. I think all of you have seen those at some point. Um, whenever somebody's interested in being in the library board, I always recommend that you check out one of those books and take a look at it so that you can see. Um, but the Library of Michigan also publishes one. The other thing that has been recently updated is the Public, public Library Financial Management Guide. The Library of Michigan does um, have that um, created on their behalf. They had Yo and Yo, which is um, a local um, accounting and auditing firm, um, create that um, for them. They contract them to do that. Alan Panter, who was um, is from Yo and Yo, was very instrumental in working on the newest updated edition. Um, he came to the December board meeting and presented each library board member with a copy of that. So. Um, I gave um, Chris and Nancy each a copy um, after that they were not on the library board when that happened. So you do have that as well. Mm -hmm. One of your handouts that you have in your packet, um, this is another Library of Michigan thing. This is United for Libraries. Um, United for Libraries is a great um, organization that does a lot to support libraries and advocacy for libraries. Um, when we uh, have our millage that did not pass in 2012, United for Libraries um, paid for us to have a consultant to come in and assist us um, with our 2014 millage campaign um, and really educate us on the best way to make sure that the public knew what was in that millage and um, why it was important. Um, so United for Libraries has a tools and resources for trustees guide um, and it's really nice because the state of Michigan does pay for all library board members to have access to that. So this. And the reason this isn't in the board packet is because this is obviously for library board trustees only. Um, there's a login and a password that is paid for by the state of Michigan, and that's this handout. So if you go to this website and click on statewide group members, um, trustee training, and put in this login and password that they have provided to you, um, you will be able to get to some really neat things. Um, there are some little 10-minute videos. Um, there's 10 of them about um, what's um, the important things to know about being a library board member. There's one on hiring a director. There's one on um, staffing, on finance. Just neat little 10 minute snippets that are great um, to give you an overview. And there are also links to PDF resources that can be printed. Um, if you need any of those, feel free to let me know and I'd be happy to print them on your behalf at the library because that's all part of being a library board member. And then last but not least, um, there is a lovely article, 10 Ways to Avoid Violating the Open Meetings Act by <laughs> Anne Emsuri, who is our attorney. It is in her best interest that we don't do anything we're not supposed to do. So she um, made sure that you can have access to that as well. Gave me permission to print you a copy so that you may read through that. It's, it's quick and easy. Um, if you review it on review it on from time to time to make sure that I haven't forgotten anything. I know it's really <laughs> it's so easy to get into the habit of like the the email thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen that happen right. so many times where you respond to a group email 
Yeah, mm -hmm. by responding to everybody. Right. As soon as you do that, if you're talking about anything that might later be voted on, yeah. then yeah. you have violated the Open Meetings Act because you're conducting mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah. You're so we are very, very careful yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I also, ha also have included in your handouts a copy of our bylaws, mm -hmm. which, as I mentioned earlier, are available on the website. Oh, any questions? Comments? <laughs> Sorry, surprise me. It's like it's homework. It's homework, yes. <laughs> there's tons of information there. I, obviously, there's going to be quite a lot of that that you already know, um, and there are other things that you may or may not know. Um, if you have questions, I'm at your back and call. Feel free to let me know if you have any. I really like this thing from the United for Libraries because that's something that I always think that we need more of is trustee mm -hmm. education. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's really neat and they're really quick yeah. and easy. Um, I do know that some library boards um, decide, have decided to take a year and 10 minutes before their meeting they sit down and watch one of those videos. Now I can't put it as part of the meeting because if I put it as part of the meeting then I'm televising something that has copyright sure. attached to it. Oh. Um, but <laughs> we can sit quietly and watch it and then you can discuss it after the meeting becomes um, open session. Um, but I can't, but because we record our meetings, can't televise that piece. Yeah. Right. So we could watch it prior to the meeting. Mm -hmm. so. so we may decide that that yeah, would that's, be. You know, yeah, that's, you know. So you could decide to do something like that, or sure. you could go in and look at it, and if there are ones that you mm -hmm. feel like you wanted to watch on your own and then discuss the meeting, you can do that. But some library boards have been doing that as just an opportunity to, oh, um, or if there's one that somebody goes through and watches and says, wow, this is really good, I, I, mm -hmm. I recommend we take a look at this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Yep, so feel free to do that. I'm open to, okay. this is your meeting, so I, um, you know, I just put it all together for you and make sure it happens. Um, last but certainly not least, we try really hard um, as a staff, uh, because you are not compensated, to make sure that your meetings are efficient and that we use your time respectfully. Um, so please, if there's anything that you would like to see done differently, feel free to let me know that. They do an exception job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. It runs very smooth. We try to keep it as, we try to, obviously, um, in the director's report, you'll see over the course of time that I, I try to keep you up to date on all the little things that are going on. And that way, when it does show up on your board meeting agenda, you've already talked about it a few times, or you've heard me talk about it several times. So um, it does help the meetings become more efficient. Okay. Hey, any comments or questions? No, good job. Thank yeah. you. That's good. It's excellent to review, and those it of us who've been on the board, us. we appreciate the mm -hmm. review also. Mm -hmm. So it is a lot of information for for new board members, right. but right. Um, it it all starts to make sense as we yeah, go through things. Yeah. Yeah. It only takes a few meetings before you're into the rhythm of it. Right. And, and, and Julie does try very hard to spread out things we have to deal with. So even though we received information on policy, mm -hmm. we may not discuss it until next month because it fits better into the agenda. Mm -hmm. And if there is a if there is a lot on your agenda, and I said, oh, we're going to put it on the February agenda, and a bunch of things come up that I did not realize were going to come up, I will push it back because mm -hmm. policies can wait, um, and things that are that are more timely. So we, I try to space things out to ensure that you don't end up with one meeting that's three hours and another meeting that's fifteen minutes. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially for the not having a three-hour meeting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants a three-hour meeting. <laughs> Thank you. And that's a good thing for all of us to review. Mm -hmm. And I will now accept a motion for adjournment. So move. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion is carried. The meeting is adjourned at 726. Thank you.